This episode wraps up our software preservation webinar series. Can't believe it. Um, we hope that everyone has enjoyed the series. It does represent the collective effort of many people, including Sarah, um, William Kilbride, uh, Paul Wheatley, um, and our, the rest of our colleagues at the DPC, as well as the SPIN training, education, uh, training and education group, and all of your research and facilitation leads for, for the past few episodes. Um, today, I just want to start with a quick overview um, and also introduce our guests, and then we will dive into our roundtable discussion. I'm also joined today by two members of the SPIN Legal and Policy Working Group, Tess White from University of Toronto and Paula Jablonner from the Computer, Hi the Computer History Museum. So during our last call, our esteemed guests articulated both legal considerations for software preservation, sharing, and reuse, and also took care to point out differences in national intellectual property regimes. Today, we are going to explore the coupling of software preservation to public accountability and explore the role of community governance on the one hand and the design of information systems on the other as complements to formal legal mechanisms for ensuring long-term access to software. We'll also explore ways to instantiate a collective action solution that treats software as an international shared resource among cultural stewardship and research organizations, or the relationship of that collective action to, again, governance, information systems, and formal legal mechanisms. And with that, I would like to introduce our esteemed guests for today's episode. Um, we have Burkhardt Schaefer, Brandon Butler, and Andrew Charlesworth. Starting with Burkhardt, um, Burkhardt Schaefer is director of the Scripps Center for IT and IP Law, where re, uh, the research team works primarily on privacy compliant software architecture, and more generally, the scope and limits of representing legal concepts directly in digital information systems. He's also co-founder and co-director of the Joseph Bell Center for Legal Reasoning and Forensic Statistics, where he develops new approaches to assist lawyers in evaluating scientific evidence and computer systems that help law enforcement agencies cooperate more efficiently across jurisdictions, work that is part of a broader research interest in computational legal theory and comparative law. Burkhardt is active in numerous organizations that exist at the intersection of computer science and law, including the German Association for Informatics, the Evidence and Investigation Network of the Scottish Institute for Policing Research, and the International Association for Artificial Intelligence and Law. We also have today Brandon Butler, the Director of Information Policy at the University of Virginia, where Brandon focuses on intellectual property, copyright, licensing, and user privacy as they are related to the acquisition, dissemination, and preservation of information and cultural artifacts. He serves as expert consultant to UVA, UVA librarians and to national and international efforts that are focused on these questions. Currently, Brandon is co-PI on an Alfred P. Sloan project to articulate a best practices code for fair use and software preservation. Brandon was previously faculty at the American University Washington College of Law, where he instructed student practitioners at the Glushko Samuelson Intellectual Property Law Clinic. Brandon is a steering committee of the Software Preservation Network. And Andrew Charlesworth is with us today, Professor of Law, Innovation, and Society, and Director of the Center for IT and Law, or CETL, the University of Bristol. He was previously reader in IT law, jointly appointed in the law school and the computer science department. Andrew has undertaken research and consultancy in legal and ethical issues arising in areas including educational web use, institutional archives and repositories, web archiving, ePortfolio and PDP tools, uh, VLEs and MLEs, institutional data sharing, web 2.0 technology, cloud computing, and research use of personal and commercial digital collections. He has worked on digital preservation and archiving projects for the British Library, the UK National Archives, and the Digital Preservation Coalition. He is currently co-editor of the Common Law World Review and serves on the editorial board of the International Journal of Digital Curation. And with that, we would like to open up our roundtable discussion. We'll start as we did with the last episode um, of sort of a getting to know you question for the three of our esteemed guests, Burkhart, Brandon, and Andrew. 
So this is to each of you to take a, a moment or two to just sort of ground us all down in who you are a bit more after those introductions, particularly in relationship to software preservation. So could each of you describe the meaning of software in your own practice, whether that's expert legal systems, as mentioned, um, viewers for content that the library pays for, authenticity of digital evidence, and so on? Sure. Should I start? Yes, feel free. Go ahead, Bert. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, um, thanks a lot for the introduction and, and, and thanks a lot for having me here. Uh, my work used to be primarily building of legal expert systems, trying to encapsulate legal knowledge in computer executable programs, and uh, as a result, assisting the judiciary, assisting legal practice um, in more efficient workflows and, and more efficient decision making. And obviously, over the last couple of years, uh, with the advent of machine learning, that has created both new opportunities, but also new challenges. And one of the big challenges here is, is definitely how we can preserve and account for these processes and this decision making. How can we make it available for judicial review? How can we create the type of historical record that we historically did with uh, court-based decision making? So to give you a very, very quick example, a year ago, in what is probably going to be one of the last um, concentration camp uh, legal trials in Germany to aid the memory of these uh, obviously now quite elderly victims, a virtual reality environment tried to recreate uh, the, 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 the camp uh, in which the accused uh, had been a, a prison guard. And that relied on the one hand massively on archival material and on historians uh, providing uh, the input but also created a new artifact, which then was used by the judges wearing a helmet, so not any longer on public display. And for me, that on the one hand raises huge challenges on how we integrate that type of technology in the courtroom, but then also how we preserve what was going on there for posterity, how we document the trial in the same way as archives have historically done this, given that this is now all happening as a piece of software and all the experience is subjective in uh, that specific helmet. So that is the type of problems I'm at the moment interested in when it comes to questions of preservation of, of software and digital artifacts in a broadly speaking legal setting. Thank you for that, Burkhardt. Uh, Andrew or Brandon, would you like to take on um, sort of the follow up to that question and introduce yourself in terms of your interest in software, your use of software in your own practice? Um, so I, I can take a, a jump at it. So um, my interest in software uh, in the context of what I do here at UVA, um, I would say is uh, twofold. Um, the, the primary interest that I have, and it was something that was sort of um, put on my plate on day one and has recurred uh, like, the, like Nietzsche's eternal recurrence ever since, um, which is the problem of vintage faculty projects. Um, uh, UVA was a uh, pioneer in the digital humanities, and we have lots of very interesting and cool things that our faculty did uh, in the early days of digital faculty projects. Um, and because it was early days, like so many other things in their developmental stages, nobody really thought about the future. Uh, and so, the kinds of problems that I deal with on a daily basis in my practice um, relating to software uh, have to do with how do we support access to these projects that were really awesome and cutting edge and cool uh, at the time and now are starting to look creaky and, and hard to mount and hard to access. Um, and this is the intellectual legacy of the university. You know, we have Jefferson's drawings and you can go put your hands on them and if you can find the right room and if somebody will unlock it for you. But we have, uh, you know, things like the digital Yakna Patafa experience created by a prominent uh, Faulkner scholar here at UVA. And no one has tried to remediate that in a little while and we can still run it in a pinch, but it's not easy and it's not getting any easier. So that's the kind of software problem that is most at the front of my mind when I uh, think about software in my daily work. 
Thank you, Brandon. Uh, Andrew, would you like to, to sort of square us off with this one and give us some context for how software plays into your practice? Yeah, I mean, my interest in this essentially comes from partly having been embedded in a computer science department for over a decade. And the interesting thing there is when the computer scientists come to me and talk about the implications of the type of work that they're doing at the moment, particularly the type of work that they're doing in terms of artificial intelligence, in terms of decision making in particular. And as Burkhardt mentioned earlier, I mean, there, this raises some very interesting questions for uh, lawyers with regard to um, how you can check how decisions are made how you can check historically how decisions are made and how you can look for things like bias in decision making, how you can interpret how that's come about, where that's come about, um, how that's got built into or been uh, excluded from a system. But in order to do that, you've actually got to have access to the software. You've got to have access to the code. If you don't have that, a lot of this um, sort of review and that may be review for practice uh, reasons. It may be review, as Burkhardt mentioned, for judicial review. How can we check that decision makers are actually making um, responsible or properly grounded decisions based on algorithmic decision making if we can't actually see what that decision making is, how that, how that has worked? Um, so that's an area where both myself and my, some of my research students are currently looking. Excellent, Andrew, and that, that gives us a beautiful segue into our first sort of major topical area for today's roundtable discussion. Um, and we're going to kick this off with Burkhart and then have you, Andrew, and you, Brandon, respond. And then we'll take turns with the following two topical areas. We'll ask each of you to sort of take ownership um, respectively on kicking these off. So starting with Burkhardt. Burkhardt, could you introduce this notion of algorithmic accountability? And then can you sort of get us started in thinking about the role of software preservation and curation in addressing or understanding algorithmic transparency and algorithmic bias? Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. Um, again, let me give you an example, one that made the headlines over the last year. Uh, in the US, uh, a quite significant number of courts are using software to assist in sentencing. And one of the specific pieces of software that is used for that is an attempt to predict the probability that a specific offender is going to reoffend. The higher the likelihood that uh, a person reoffends, the more significant typically uh, the sentence is going to be. So um, this uh, software draws on quite a lot of data. It tries to profile the individual that is in front of the court. And on that basis of generic data about um, generally people who say are uh, not with proper education or have a specific history of crime, it tries to predict uh, the likelihood that the specific offender is going to, to reoffend. So that's the general idea. Um, that specific algorithm uh, has been used for quite some while and eventually people started to look into the patterns it created, um, the patterns of, of, of decision. And one of the things that surprised quite a number of people was that it seems that this algorithm had picked up quite a number of, of nasty habits by its programmers maybe or by the uh, people who gave it data sets for training or in one form or the other it had become a racist algorithm. That is, it uh, treated uh, uh, people of color significantly more severely, uh, or the prediction that they were very offending was specifically more, more, more pessimistic than it was with uh, a white uh, offenders, everything else being, being equal. So there might be a problem here in the algorithm, or there might be a problem, more likely, in the data set that was used to train this algorithm. Now, in the next step, obviously, people want to challenge uh, this decision, especially if they were negatively affected by it. And as soon as they tried to do that, they ran up into a problem that I think you discussed in previous sessions of, of this webinar series. Uh, it turned out that the courts who were using that software didn't actually own it. They only had a license. 
And the owner said, well, actually, this is our copyright. This is our trade secrets. We are not willing to disclose this data. So you can't actually analyze in, in the trial setting uh, what was going on here. So that resulted in an uh, international discussion, I think, that and similar examples on algorithmic accountability. If more and more governmental and judicial decisions are reached by algorithms, more or less automatically, uh, how can we make sure that they haven't inherited biases? How can we make sure that they function properly, even according to their own specifications? And how can we reintroduce the same level of judicial review that we expect from human decision makers. So that started really a, a very extensive global discussion on, on how we can do this. And one aspect of that is obviously documentation and preservation. So um, it's one thing to check this algorithm right now after a problem has occurred. But uh, now that we know that there's a problem with it, we obviously also want to go back in time and say, well, when this was first used five years ago, where the problems already uh, inherent then? Or did it pick up the problems as it learned and uh, more data was fed in? So um, increasingly as we use these systems over longer periods of time, we will have to ask questions, did that algorithm work appropriately in an unbiased way three years ago, five years ago, ten years ago? Uh, what was the data set that was used to train it? Uh, were there bugs accumulating, did software upgrades uh, result in, in, in a change? So increasingly, we, we need a way to preserve in various ways and with their various parameters the decision as it was reached in that specific point in time and how the software and the other digital artifacts evolved since then. And both might be needed for various types of judicial review. Sometimes you want to go back in time and replicate how the algorithm on the basis of what was known then decided and whether it was correct, addressing, for instance, past wrongs or uh, miscarriages that happened in the past. Sometimes we want to check, has it changed over time? What is the status now? And uh, would it function correctly given what we know uh, by now about these circumstances? So one suggestion that has been made quite frequently is to have some sort of algorithm escrow, a trusted third party, some sort of repository where either the software and or the data set with which it is trained are stored, curated, protected. So if then there is a legal issue, they can be interrogated in appropriate ways. How that is done and the technical details, they are at the moment very much under-researched and we don't know a lot about it. But I would think that the legal profession here can learn a lot about archiv from archivists and the archival professions, uh, librarian professions, to understand better what is at stake here and how one can do that uh, in such a way that it complies with our ideas about access to justice and transparency in uh, governmental decision making. Thank you for that, Burkhart. Yeah, and I'm, I'm curious if Andrew and Brandon have anything to, to add to um, the introduction of sort of the whole suite of issues associated with algorithmic um, accountability before we move into kind of a more, maybe a more specific application or maybe even looking at some alternative applications um, around sort of public-private partnerships and the role of, of public accountability in software. But before we move on, yeah, any responses to, to any of Burkhardt's um, uh, sort of explanations or exploration of, of algorithmic transparency? It's a, certainly an interesting, an interesting area. And of course, it's not just legal decision-making that's in question here as well. I mean, I do quite a lot of work with um, our medical school and there are interesting decisions or interesting issues arising out of decision making in the medical context which is driven by or which is supported by sort of algorithmic um, systems um, and there too we need to be able to understand how these systems work and what happens essentially usually when things have gone wrong. There was a lovely example not too long ago of a algorithmic system that was supposed to be used to determine whether or not a person had a particular kind of cancer, I think it was. 
and the program seemed to do quite well. In fact, seemed to outperform the doctors at looking at x-rays of this cancer uh, and identifying whether or not there was a cancer there or not. Unfortunately, when they, the researchers actually started to look at how the uh, computer was beating out the doctors, they discovered that the computer had learnt that pictures with a particular copyright notice on them came from a particular clinic and that clinic specialized in the treatment of that particular form of cancer. So the software wasn't actually reading what it, they thought it was reading, which was looking at the image and determining whether the image um, had a suggested that the patient had cancer. It was simply reading the copyright notice and making a, a best guess based on, oh, well, it comes from this clinic, therefore. Um, and it's useful to be able to go back and look at these things. And it might very well be useful to look at that in a medical negligence scenario as well. Um, so the two, two thoughts that I would add to this discussion, um, which take us a, a little bit of field from the question of preservation, or at least one, one of those thoughts takes us a little bit of field from the question of preservation. But I think it's interesting, so I'll, I'll throw it in there, and it's it's something I know. So um, is uh, there's a, a really helpful article uh, by Amanda Lewandowski on the question of um, how intellectual property might actually uh, create bias in algorithms, and and how uh, application of different parts of intellectual property, in particular the fair use doctrine in the U.S., um, would help to unbias algorithms. Um, and it's in a way, it's it's similar in a, in a perverse way to the story that Andrew tells. You know, the, the presence of a copyright notice can change the way a machine behaves. Um, and for uh, for people who are trying to teach a machine something, the presence of a copyright notice uh, might prevent them from putting that material into the machine in the first place. And so uh, Amanda tells good stories about the preference for public domain data sets or Creative Commons licensed data sets. Um, people that go back again and again to the same, you know, deemed safe data sets as ways to train their AI, um, and that creates a bunch of AIs that have all been learning from the same stuff, and that means there's not much diversity, and it means that the stuff they've been learning from has been artificially constrained by copyright law. Um, but I, I agree completely with Amanda's second part of her article after she sort of recounts the risk which is that, again, at least in the U.S. under fair use uh, precedent, um, we can do a lot more with our AI and with our algorithms um, by feeding them all kinds of stuff um, under the fair use doctrine uh, that uh, otherwise might not be permissible um, because uh, training an AI is not the kind of thing that copyright is supposed to prevent you from doing at least on the theory of copyright that predominates in the US. And so, and we have good case law on that in the form of Google Books and Hottie Trust, the two Authors Guild cases, um, where judges have said, look, letting computers read uh, things where no one else is reading them um, is the kind of thing that fair use should permit. And I, I, I want to foreground this only because I think uh, the issues Burkhard raises about um, the bias, bias in algorithms are real, and yet we have policy discussions in the EU about uh, text and data mining, uh, where we're being told that this is something that should be paid for and licensed. Um, and once you make people pay for and license the material they're feeding their robots, it might change what they feed their robots, and that might change the way those robots think again. So um, another reason to think that maybe text and data mining and this, this kind of activity um, should not be distorted by copyright concerns. Um, the other thing I just I want to do is point generically toward one other thinker who's uh, smarter than me and thought more about this, um, which is um, uh, there's a, a nice article about this by Cliff Lynch, uh, and and Cliff has takes a rather dramatic uh, view um, that that we might we might have to give up on the notion that we can collect and curate and make sense of algorithms. Um, Cliff suggests that uh, at least most, many of the algorithms we care about are privately held, they're extremely complicated, uh, 
Uh, Facebook is not going to give us their algorithm. And even if they wanted to, um, uh, Cliff points to the, to the sad state of the Twitter archive at the Library of Congress um, to show that um, at least on their own, and this may foreshadow the need for consortial arrangements that we'll talk about later, but at least on their own, most you know, scholarly institutions don't have the kind of resources that private uh, industries have to support the um, running of these really complicated uh, systems. Um, so, you know, Cliff suggests a series of kind of um, cheats. Uh, you know, maybe we can take a snapshot. We can have a Nielsen family that we monitor their interactions and, and use that as a way of preserving what the algorithm was like um, rather than trying to preserve the algorithm itself. Um, so, uh, anyway, that, those two articles are worth seeking out, in my view, if you're thinking about algorithms and the future of understanding them and, and trying to hold them accountable. Thanks, Brandon. This is Paula from the Computer History Museum. And just to continue on with what Brandon was talking about, can, um, I'd love, Andrew, if you could start us off talking about um, your thoughts on access and preservation methods to these private algorithms that are clearly um, in for the public use and public good, and how can we try to make them more accessible and preserve them? Thanks. Andrew? Helps if you unmute, I find. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah. It, uh, it's, it, as I say, it's, it's a, uh, a complicated area, as, as Brandon was, was indicating. Um, I mean, one of the areas that we've been looking at, I think, is, is the area of the provision of public services. And those provisions of public services may be by public sector organisations, but they may equally be pr provided through private sector organisations. And there is a case, I think, to be made that when, organ when um, local and central governments purchase either software or they purchase services mediated through software, there is a case for saying the government ought to be requiring, if not escrow then at least access to the software assets that are used to provide those services because if we don't have access to the software code um, we may run into issues of maintenance we may run into issues of um, legal liability as we've already discussed um, and I think there is scope in terms of putting the power of government behind this kind of process uh, of getting government to think longer term than government tends to you tend to find central government tends to think in five-year bursts uh, local government perhaps a little longer perhaps not um, but they need to be thinking in longer term about the value of their investment in this area and how they protect that uh, investment in a sort of ongoing way. Um, I'm going to turn it over there, I think. Brandon Burkhardt, do you have anything additional to add, particularly on the topic of public private partnerships and yeah. software curation? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, um, I, I, I basically agree with, with Andrew, um, and uh, there are definitely, at least in parts, developments in that direction. If you look at the data ethics framework of the Cabinet Office, for instance, there is at least an assumption being expressed there that if you are uh, using algorithms, if you are using software in the public sector, then if possible, it should be open source, and if it is not possible, then it should come with appropriate licenses that uh, allow uh, post-decision scrutiny and that simply becomes part of the deal that you make with the private uh, suppliers and you use your market muscles as a government as a, ma as a major customer on that. Uh, one can go a step further, uh, one can create legal requirements that certain types of uh, software are preserved. In that case we simply sideline 
copyright law. We don't even need to create new, new exemptions within copyright law. It simply becomes a, a legal duty um, along the same lines that we see, for instance, in data protection law. Uh, fulfilling a legal duty is simply one of the uh, grounds of processing. Uh, and, and, and in that way, these uh, other regimes can simply be uh, amended or, or accommodated. Now, I think the big problem, though, is that uh, unlike automated decision making, unlike the software that was used by, by government agencies in the, say, 1990s and, and the early millennium, which tended to be symbolic, rule-based, uh, classical expert systems that remained more or less static, we are dealing now with machine learning. And uh, that means that we have not just the algorithm itself, not just the software itself, we also need the data sets with which they were trained. And that opens up uh, a total new bang, uh, bag of problems, uh, both for copyright, but also for, for data protection law potentially, and for a whole host of other rights. So even if um, the software developer is quite happy to hand over or make available the algorithm, the software for preservation, the mathematical formulas, they in turn might not own the training sets uh, with which that, that, that algorithm was trained initially or changed over time as it was deployed. Um, and uh, Brandon mentioned the uh, discussion that we have at the moment in the European Union about uh, the right to mine, if you have the right to, to, to read. Um, think about data that is simply taken from web crawlers from the internet to feed into one of these algorithms. So you might have a piece of software that is really good at emulating human speech, obviously one of the important drivers of AI. Um, one thing is preser preserving that software, that's, that's the easy part, but if it learns dynamically simply from text that it grabs from blogs, from Twitter, from, from other sources, then we get into a different set of, of, of issues, also in terms of preservation. Uh, it might well be that we are reaching here the limits of what can be done. Um, that should have implications of what we then do with it. Do we simply accept that or do we simply say, well, that simply unfortunately means we can't use software in certain types of domains, even though it might be otherwise beneficial. But I think with machine learning, we face this dual problem that it is not any longer the software. It is additional data sets, the training data. That training data can have a whole range of different formats, which obviously poses preservation challenges. Could be images, could be sound files, could be text, uh, but they also come with very, very different regimes, uh, legal regimes attached to it, from copyright to data protection to other uh, rights that give various institutions control over these data. So I think we face here a considerable more problematic set because of that dynamic nature of modern AI. Excellent. Brandon, do you have anything you'd like to add before Jess kicks off the next question? Well, the last thing I'll say very, very quickly is that uh, the, the, the question of public, private public partnerships and, and whether and how to, um, you know, act affirmatively on the front end, either by law or by policy or by good practice um, to uh, extract better licensing terms from the software vendors that you work with or to demand that you only use software that's licensed under, you know. Um, all of that, I think, is, is, um, is part of the general kind of bi-directional model that I use to think about all of this stuff, which is sometimes you have to think about uh, how can we plan for preservation in a time when uh, we're at sort of time negative one, you know, we haven't crossed the threshold of making any decisions that are going to impact our preservation capacity in the future. So we can plan and we can anticipate and we can say, uh, how should we structure this deal? Uh, or how should we regulate this practice um, going forward? And I think those are th that time frame is the time to think about all of the things that we've been discussing in terms of, you know, again, using the right form of license, requiring the right kind of vendor, and so on. Um, the other direction, though, that sometimes you find yourself at sort of T plus 10, right? <laughs> Um, someone, someone made a lot of decisions for you in the 1990s or 2000s. Uh, they weren't thinking about this at all, and you have to look backward. Um, and that's where we have to get 
um, creative and thinking about what are the limitations and exceptions in copyright and the other laws that govern the use of these materials so that we can remedy uh, the oversights and, and, and mistakes of the past. So anyway, I just wanted to make that general framework point, which that's the way I think about all this stuff is looking forward and looking backward. Oh, thank you very much, you guys. Um, our last question, I'm just looking at the time, we have about 20 minutes left. So maybe if we give like 10 minutes to this question and then that leaves kind of 10 minutes for questions and answers from the audience. Does that sound good? Yes, okay. Um, so our last question is, is about how many of our listeners are currently exploring consortial efforts to share and, and reuse software together. And what we're wondering is, we have this sort of role of technology on one hand and then the role of governance on the other. And we wanna know like, if you have any ideas about how we can think about designing those technical systems for, with reducing legal risk in mind. So like if we build a collaborative repository for software preservation that can like manage and use non-publicly available software, can, can we or do we need to start thinking about governance and agreements and, and, and how we can kind of manage those things and those licenses that, you know, and what Brandon was just talking about at like a technical level. Is there value in that? So, so I'll, I can kick it off because this is something I'm, I'm thinking about a little bit in connection with the uh, uh, fair use best practices work that we're doing. Um, uh, as Jessica mentioned at the beginning, and as I've discussed on, on the first webinar in this part of the series, um, a lot of my, although I have my local UVA stuff like Digital Yakma Batafa, a lot of my work the last couple of years has been a, around working with SPIN and uh, thinking about fair use in particular as a grounding for a, a U.S. based, um, you know, consortial arrangement that would uh, have lots of libraries and other uh, memory institutions, museums, and archives um, contributing software to a collective effort. Um, and the things that we learned in the um, consultations that we've done as part of the Fair Use Best Practices grant, um, uh, among them were that uh, both governance and technology um, are things that people think are important. That, that getting those two things right is actually part of what the community believes will help to make this effort legitimate. That is, uh, you know, um, in thinking about what makes something a fair use, um, part of the way the best practices process works is we ask professionals to consider, uh, from the point of view of their mission, um, when the use of copyrighted material without permission is fair and legitimate in a kind of broad sense. Um, and then keeping in mind, you know, the court's particular interest in what's called transformative use. So a use that is different uh, from the original intended commercial use. Um, and so we ask folks to think about, you know, what are the kinds of things that you need to do as part of your mission that are transformative, that are really different from the ordinary commercial exploitation, the ordinary consumer market, uh, and so on, such that then you could, you could make a compelling fair use argument. Uh, and, and this is really important to start from these kind of broad first principles because there's no case law. You know, no one's ever sued a library for this before that we know of. If you've been sued, give me a call. Um, <laughs> and so we're not working from precedent. We don't have any judge that has said, here's what happens when someone tries to preserve software. We have to work from by analogy and by broad principles. So when we talk to professionals about what makes software preservation a legitimate transformative activity, um, some part of that conversation consistently has been dedicated to a fair and mission-driven governance model. That is a model that is tethered to the kinds of activities that software preservation professionals do that are not commercial activities, that are not consumer-facing activities, um, and, the, and the kinds of users they serve that are, again, not ordinary consumers, not ordinary users. Um, so having a governance model that 
um, puts control in the hands of those professionals and um, envisions uses that are unique to them was really important. And likewise, using the technological affordances that we have now, um, things like emulation as a service that can be configured to, um, to permit certain kinds of access and certain kinds of use, certain kinds of configuration, certain kinds of exports out from the environment. You know, can I, can I, can I use the simulation environment to write my novel and then export to PDF, right? Um, or can we configure that environment to be something that's useful to scholars and researchers, maximally useful to scholars and researchers, but, but not the kind of thing that would be a substitute or a replacement for the average Joe who just wants to get their hands on, on a product that would be useful to them. So, so taking advantage of governance models and technology uh, tools and, and affordances to tailor the, the overall effort in a way that keeps the practices um, of the community within that transformative um, lane was really important and something that we're going to try to capture when we do the final best practices document later in the fall. So yeah, I think, I think governance and technology can be really powerful ways to create a, um, a, an initiative that is fair and legitimate and will withstand sort of the scrutiny of the kinds of gatekeepers that you're going to want to convince um, that this is okay. Thank you, Brendan. Um, Burkert, Andrew, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, um, just picking up on, 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 on the role of, of tech for the governments, um, there are certain aspects of the relevant legal environment which seem to be like really good and very promising applications of by design solutions. So for instance, look at a, a project that was uh, done as part of Horizon 2020, I think in the uh, European Union, the Marcos project. What they tried to do was to automatize um, the software licenses that come with Creative Commons uh, endeavors. So if you are a software engineer and uh, you want to combine lots and lots of pieces of software that uh, are, for instance, on GitHub, it, it reads these licenses for you and calculates a strategy to combine them so that it meets your goals. So it calculates the overall value, if you like, of the license that you would get out if you combine all these previous licenses in a specific way. And that is, of course, tremendously useful because the ordinary uh, programmer will not be legally trained. If there are lots and lots of pieces of software combined here, even for a lawyer, it becomes quite difficult to see how um, one that has a um, um, use-alike license attached to it interacts with another piece of software that comes with an attribution-only license or, or things like that. So certain things can be automatized, and that is extremely helpful. It creates trust between the participants because you can then prove that uh, no violation of, of the rules can happen because they are embedded in the infrastructure. So uh, that has also some sociological advantages. Unfortunately, especially the type of legal provision that Brandon has been talking about, fair use, they are considerably more difficult to encode. Uh, they involve uh, subjective judgments about importance of parts of a work. They uh, involve um, some impression of how it appears to me as a human when I look at it. And, and they are very, very difficult to, to encapsulate uh, through a easily executable uh, software program. Machine learning might help, but as Brendan says, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of cases. So we are in a way in a dilemma on both counts. Uh, it's very difficult to turn them uh, in, in, in rules a, through a priori reasoning, simply translating legal text and compute executable programs. And we also don't have the experience base, a database from which you could then extract automatically some feeling of was that okay, was that fair use, or was it staying too close at the original. So some of these could be very exciting research projects, but they are, I think, at the moment at least, not yet suitable as, as regulatory tools. For certain types of um, auxiliary work, assistant work, uh, I think we can by now uh, help there quite a lot and have interesting interactions between archives, uh, libraries, and uh, computer researchers. Think about, for instance, of orphan works. Uh, you have lots and lots of images. It would be very difficult to determine the age of them manually. 
you could to a certain extent by now try to do this through algorithms, through software, and take some of the burden from you. And as you release the pressure of some of these burdens, you free up capacities to do the more interesting stuff. And that again would be along the lines Brendan suggested, um, thinking about how far should we push the, the, the models to be as far away as possible from the commercial applications, be transformative, and with that, get into a protected legal environment. I think the, to sort of, I suppose, wrap up this, I mean, one of my interests in this is the extent to which, I'm going to use the term we here, I suppose, um, in which the, this community adequately gets over the kind of messages that we're having in, the, in this forum, for instance, to the public more widely. And by public, I mean um, the general public, but also to business and indeed to regulators and politicians. And one of the things we see with um, the approach towards software in copyright law has been a very certainly in the UK copyright law, a very sort of gradual, a very incremental approach, a very, oh, well, if we must, we'll do something about it type approach. So the, the idea of um, text and data mining, there's a text and data mining copyright exception in UK law, which allows researchers to make copies um, of work for computational ana analysis. Um, if they already have the right to read the work. So if you already own access to the database, you can use that database for data mining, even though that's not the use that you originally licensed it for, which was to read the work. Um, however, you're only allowed to do that for non-commercial research. And that's an interesting divide in and of itself, because quite a lot of what we do has commercial implications, even if we're in academia. At what point do we draw the line between uh, commercial and non-commercial research. So I think one of the things we need to be to be doing as a result of these kinds of fora is actually going out to people and saying these are the issues, these are the things that the uh, librarian, the archiving, the legal academic, the library academic community are talking about, but these are things which are of general application to you. These are things that are going to increasingly influence, increasingly potentially change your lives. And we need to have a wider, I think, public debate about how that takes place. Well, thank you, Andrew, for that. And the call to action, I think, is, is greatly appreciated. And hopefully we can explore, uh, we can explore that more um, and we do have a question I just saw in the chat, but hopefully we can explore that more in future programming or as a follow up to this in terms of what are some of the things that all of the participants on the call today, for example, can do to sort of follow that path that you just laid out, Andrew, in terms of making this a bigger discussion. How can we use our platform as digital preservationists, librarians, archivists to engage like a broader public? Um, in in terms of understanding the impact that these things have on their daily lives. But with that, for now, I'll say thank you, a huge thank you to Burkhart, Andrew, and Brandon, our esteemed guests today. Um, we're going to go ahead and take any questions that we have time for. We maybe have time for a couple of questions. Um, and just as a reminder, if you did have questions or topics, either specifically for Burkhart, Andrew, or Brandon, or for the whole group, and we do not get to them today, go ahead and chat them. Uh, we will be tracking uh, any questions that we don't get to, as Sarah said in the beginning of the call, and we can follow up with Burkhart, Andrew, and Brandon to get some of your questions answered um, after the webinar if, if there's anything that isn't addressed. So we do have a question, which is, um, if, if any of you know, yeah, if this is from Jess White, if any of you know whether or not the um, the discussion around the ability to mine text that we own or have the right to use or read is also true in Canada and the U.S. Um, and, and Jess says they've negotiated at University of Toronto for purchased e-resources, but they would like to know if there's a strong case for that being um, an automatic. 
Yeah, so I can answer that uh, for the U.S. context, and I think probably by analogy, the Canadian context. Um, and it's a little bit of a, you know, it's a downer answer, but um, I, I wrote a little thing. I wrote, I wrote this up. I'll, I'll, I'll make sure this ends up in the resources for the webinar. I wrote this up for Open Access Week um, earlier this year for Spark. Um, but um, in my view, possession is still nine-tenths of the law in this area. And the problem for us, even in the U.S., where fair use means that once we've got it, we can, we can text mine it all day long. The problem is for, for databases, we typically don't have it. Uh, it is physically on someone else's server, uh, the, the database that we'd like to mine, and their physical control over that server lets them set the terms of our access, right? And so uh, at that point, you're in a private negotiation and, and you can say the right to read is the right to mine and you can insist on it and you can stamp your feet. And I think you should, but there's no legal lever that you have to use to pry that right loose. You just have um, your you know, mode of persuasion, which um, I, I urge you to use, but that's what you've got as far as I, I'm concerned. That's my belief. Thank you for that, Brandon. I'm curious um, if any if anyone else in the audience has uh, any questions as either a follow up to uh, this discussion around sort of the algorithm as well as the data set and the coupling of those two together. So text mining kind of being an example, but also sort of the medical and um, legal recommendation system examples that Andrew and Burkhart brought up earlier. Um, or if there are examples about how you in your institutional context are thinking about consortial solutions for software preservation and curation. Um, any sort of additional thoughts from participants before Sarah wraps us up? Okay, well, if there are any that come to mind, um, you'll hear from us again. This won't be the last time. And hopefully, uh, Burkhardt, Andrew, Brandon, and Kendra, who was with us during our last episode, would be willing to join us again to sort of uh, extend or explore some of the more nuanced topics that we were only able to touch on briefly during today's conversation. So with that, thank you everyone for attending. Thank you to our esteemed guests, uh, Burkhart, Andrew, and Brandon for joining us. It was a pleasure to be here with you today. And I'll hand it off to Sarah to wrap us up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. We've appreciated you being here today and over the course of the, the series as well. Um, just to say again, to reiterate that in the next 24 hours, uh, everyone here and who's attended the webinars in the series will be invited to provide feedback about the series. Uh, so this was a survey of the software preservation context. So we need you to tell us where you would like us to dig deeper, uh, which work you'd like to learn more about, whose work you'd like to learn more about, um, and any questions that were never asked that you thought should have been part of the, of the software preservation discussion. Um, so we hope that by telling us what your needs and preferences are, then you'll be able to enable us to design a future software preservation programming that means more to you. And that's it, I think. Um, thank you very much again. And we look forward to sharing the recording with you, hopefully by the end of the week. Thanks again. <laughs>